This week, we talk with Ian Iberg from Nano VMs. In the news segment, a format string resurfaces, Bluetooth anonymity dives, DevOps needs security to stay afloat, and more. Stay tuned for Application Security Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production. False positives suck. With so many mobile apps to test, how much time will you waste on false positives? Eliminate them today with NowSecure. Only NowSecure automates static, dynamic, and interactive testing on real Android and iOS devices. Now you get speed, accuracy, and efficiency for DevOps, plus the broadest coverage of security, compliance, and privacy issues. Why waste time on false positives? Visit securityweekly.com forward slash NowSecure to learn how to scale your mobile app sec testing with NowSecure. Signal Sciences secures the most important web applications, APIs, and microservices of the world's leading companies, protecting over 7,500 applications and 150 billion production requests per week. Signal Sciences NextGen WAF and RASP help companies increase security and maintain site reliability without sacrificing velocity, all at the lowest total cost of ownership. Signal Sciences patented technology protects any application against any attack with integrations into any DevOps tool chain. Signal Sciences, demand more from your WAF. Learn more at signalsciences.com forward slash PSW. Welcome to Application Security Weekly. This is episode 70, recorded July 22nd, 2019. I'm your host, Mike Shima, and I'm here with Matt Alderman. Hey, Matt. Morning. I have Milo, too. Milo sitting on my lap, so we'll see how well he does for this show. <laughs> Always good to have the feline assistant. And we also have John Kinsella. Howdy, guys. My favorite way to start a Monday. Excellent. Glad to have you here. My favorite way too. We also have exciting news about the Security Weekly webcast program. We are now partnered with ISC Squared as an official CPE provider. If you attend any of our webcasts, you will be receiving one CPE credit per webcast. Register for our upcoming webcast with ISC Squared by going to securityweekly.com slash webcasts. If you have missed any of our previously recorded webcasts, you can find our on-demand library at securityweekly.com slash on-demand. Are you trying to make a big splash at Black Hat this year? We will be recording Paul's Security Weekly from our suite at Mandalay Bay in Vegas and have a couple of sponsored interview slots left. Grab them before they're gone by submitting your request on securityweekly.com slash booking. Ian Iberg is the CEO at Nano VMs. He was handed his first Slackware floppies in 9495, told good luck, and hasn't looked back since. Ian is a noted authority on the cross section of operating systems and security, and is on a mission to upgrade the underlying infrastructure of the internet one box at a time. Hello, Ian. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, guys. How's it going? Glad to be here. Glad you're here, and um, you're, you're on a mission going from, I guess, you know, one box at a time. But I think more recently, you're starting us off at one kernel at a time, or maybe we, you know, talking about unikernels. So before we dive into details, um, can you welcome us with a little bit of an intro about what a unikernel actually is? Sure. Yeah. So uh, unikernels, at the end of the day, are just kind of a, you know, I I liken it to a new deployment methodology. And so uh, typically today, you know, if, if you're going to deploy an application on, say, the cloud, you might spin up a Linux instance, then you might use something like Chef or Puppet or Terraform or, you know, the list goes on forever um, uh, to install your applications on top of that operating system. What a lot of people don't really think about, even though they might intuitively know, is, is that now you're running two Linuxes on top of that public cloud. And our, uh, our whole question with unikernels are, do we really need two layers of Linux? Um, and in our opinion, the answer is no. All we really want to do is run that one application um, as a VM. And so that's that's kind of the basic idea at the end of the day is you don't need a whole general purpose operating system running there. You can just run that one application. And hopefully in doing so, um, your system's going to run a lot safer and a lot faster because of that reason. 
Yeah, so it's a lot in that part is you're starting to get to some of those security, um, the, the security story behind it, because what you're really doing, if I understand correctly, is, you know, this is, here's a single process system. So we're reducing the attack surface and the file system is quite explicitly the only files that you need. It's not even a sandbox with a couple extra bin SH right. or things like that. It's just that the app uses these files. So we're going to include these files and nothing else. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good point. I mean, there's a there's something like ten different unikernel implementations out there today. Um, a lot of them don't even have, you know, a classic file system like ext2 or for uh, zfs or anything like that. Um, obviously, for for a lot of the purposes that we're looking at, microservices and things of that nature, um, you, you know, your web servers, your databases, they need a file system. But if if you look at it, there might be ten files on it. You know, it's it's like a half a dozen libraries that your application needs, and then um, you know maybe some static assets for your for your web server. But you're not going to find userlib with a thousand libraries on it. You're not going to find a Etsy, uh, you know, directory with a thousand different <laughs> uh, config files in it. You're not going to find varlib with log files for God knows what. Um, you're just not going to find any of that. So. So that starts to speak to the, the the SEC part of DevSecOps, but let's step back a little bit too. And what from the DevOps angle, what are some of the ways that this might appeal or would be different even for that matter from a DevOps perspective in terms of just deploying via containers or moving towards serverless and um, yeah. using you know, AWS Lambda? Yeah, um, good question. Uh, that's, that's actually one of the things that we kind of like about this is because um, over the past five or six years, you've seen the DevOps ecosystem kind of increasing complexity quite a bit, especially with the rise of containers and Kubernetes and all this sort of stuff. And, uh, you know, that ecosystem we think has been kind of going in the wrong direction. They keep on adding more and more layers versus removing layers. And so, uh, you know, from just the simplicity versus complexity angle, uh, we kind of see this as much more simple. To give you an idea, today um, we can use a tool called Ops, for instance, and we can take a Go binary or JVM or whatever, and in two commands, we can create a Google Cloud instance out of it. So one command builds the image, and this is like an actual true blue GCE image or an EC2 instance, and then the other command pushes out and deploys it, and it's running. Um, so that's, that's definitely quicker, and there's a lot less moving parts. Um, from that point of view. And and I think that, one of the advantages here, Ian, right, is if we think about the container and all the dependencies that kind of get embedded in the in the container image, right? If I'm using a certain language, I'm inheriting a bunch of dependencies. With a unikernel, I can get rid of some of that, right? And and really shrink down not only what's running, but also the attack surface associated with what's in that unikernel. Yeah. And just to uh, just to kind of point this out, um, we're not even close to <laughs> to the point where we want to be in terms of uh, you know removing all the cruft that is built over the past 30, 40 years. Um, I'll give you an example right now. Uh, libxslt is a library that's found in pretty much every single interpreted language out there, and so as you might guess, this deals with XML parsing, or so you would think. Um, and, but like literally your default installs a Ruby, Python, Node, um, any of these interpreted languages all use it because they borrow a couple of functions from it. But also in that same library, you're going to find an FTP server because God knows we need some FTP server code laying around. <laughs> um, and so it's, it's, it's things like that, that, you know, is kind of driving a lot of this is the fact that we don't really want all these dependencies. And the unikernel uh, today takes it that step forward by kind of eliminating everything else that um, besides what the app wants. But in the future, you could look at, you know, even customizing some of these libraries like like your libxml and your libxslt and things of that nature to the point to where we can start finally, um, you know, kind of dealing with with all this cruft that's been going on for for a while now. I mean, not to date any of us here, but uh. Linux is like 30 years old now, and it's largely the same thing as Unix, which is 50 years old. So it, those operating systems were built in a kind of uh, completely different time period. 
you know, when, when Unix was uh, co-created by Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie back in 1969, um, they were working on computers like the PDP-7, the PDP-11. And so those, those computers, when they came out, they cost half a million dollars. They, uh, they took up an entire wall. They had to run multiple users with multiple processes. But if you fast forward today in 2019, even a small like 20 person company might have hundreds or thousands of uh, containers and VMs running around. And if you look at how DevOps people actually deploy, they're already treating their VMs like single applications anyways. Yeah, they have other programs running, but they're, they're already kind of treating it like that. So, so we're just trying to kind of push them over the edge, so to speak. Right. They're running it as a single uh, VM, but with a whole lot of crap hanging around it that yeah. just makes it susceptible to attack. Right. Yeah. Now, what about so and th that's definitely a great theme. And even, you know, Go was going that direction in the sense of just having everything be statically compiled. So, you know, be a, be one super monolithic blob that you can push you know move around everywhere um but to some degree there could be a trade-off here i'm going to guess with with unikernels so we're starting to you know get a little get rid of a lot of the cruft do some really good steps of reducing the attack surface but does that also mean we're going to lose a lot of visibility into the application itself whether it is logging or debugging or even instrumenting it for um, security yeah. reasons yeah, good, good question. Um, I think the first person to bring that up was Brian Cantrell over at Joyent. And uh, he wrote this article called Unikernels are Completely Undebuggable, which is funny because his buddy, Brendan Gregg, um, came out with an article like two weeks after that showing him uh, doing like flame graph profiling of Unikernels. So, uh, but, uh, but yeah, so, so when we talk about debugging um, and observability, uh, there's there's a couple different classes of technology that we're really talking about and it depends on the context of what people are saying uh the first one would be like just basic logging and things like that um how do i get my logs well uh you know most production setups that i've worked in they typically will ship logs out to a remote log server whether that's Elasticsearch or it's splunk or it's even just a remote syslog it doesn't matter typically people will ship that out but even if you want to keep it locally on disk, um, you're easily able to get get at that through uh, through the console. So that's not that's not really a problem. Now, when we talk about APM, you know, your new relics, data dogs, Prometheus, things of that nature, um, you know, all that just works out of the box because a lot of that is in app anyways. Uh, so there's that, and then then you have things like. Um, you know, my database is thrashing and I have no clue what's going on. I need to SSH in and, you know, attach S trace or, you know, do whatever. And typically what we kind of say about that is, is that uh, for classic application debugging, we recommend people actually debug locally in their dev environment. We're not, we're not a huge fan of trying to interrupt a production application and debugging in production. Um, so, you know, things like that, you can turn on. We have an S-Trace equivalent in our kernel nanos, for instance. Um, and you can flip that on and you can see all the different calls that are happening. Um, and obviously, same thing with profiling. However, if you do turn that on, realize that it's going to tremendously slow down things in production the exact same way that it would in Linux. So... I'm curious makes... about some implementations of security technologies, right? So you have different approaches to looking at uh, the application, right? Agent-based technologies, kernel-based technologies, you know, sidecars, uh, privileged containers, et cetera, et cetera. If you're running a unikernel, do you does some of those solutions now get limited because they can't function? Do do kernel Technologies like a CrowdStrike or a Sysdig work with a unikernel, or are they completely blind? I'm I'm just curious because I don't know what. Yeah, so it's it's probably kind of a tool by tool basis. Um, you know, Sysdig is inherently using parts of the Linux kernel that um, you know, for instance, in our kernel, we don't we simply don't have support for. It. Um, so yeah, th there are definitely tooling changes that would need to happen on a kind of per uh, per kernel basis. Um, other other implementations have added other stuff, um, so it it kind of depends. As for the sidecar stuff, I know that's kind of a a pattern that 
um, people using container land quite a bit. Um, just to be clear on that, uh, pretty much every single unikernel implementation out there that claims to be a unikernel is what we call a single process system. And so by its very nature, it doesn't even have the fork and exec family uh, set of system calls for something like a sidecar to actually work that way. Um, however, there's nothing stopping you from implementing some sort of plugin, uh, if so to speak, as another thread. So, so a lot of the unikernel implementations will support the concept of multiple threads, um, just, just not like the, the ancient fork and exec style of uh, scaling. Which is how we built most of the security solutions from ancient technology. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, so, so that's, this kind of gets at the crux of like why people are excited about unikernels. You look at something like Postgres. You know, Postgres is just as, just as old as Linux is, right? I mean, it's, it's, uh, a lot of people like it, but at the same time, it's kind of like, okay, well, you know, we've had native threads in Linux since like 98 or 99 was when, um, Ingo, I think, put them in. And so, you know, even the, the, the guys who wrote Fork back in the 70s, they themselves said it was a hack. Uh, and so, you know, I think, I, I think part of this is just like our roads and bridges, our digital roads and bridges are falling down. And we need to kind of do something about that. We, we just can't keep on um, tacking layers of mud on top of it. You know, we, at the end of the day, we do need to actually rewrite some of this stuff and use different tools and the different technologies that are available to us. Hey, Ian, um, it's, it's been, you know, we've chatted once or twice, and it's been fun watching you guys over the last few years as you sort of grow, and um, congrats on all the success and the funding and everything. I, I think what might be interesting for some of our listeners to hear is, you know, it sounds almost like, ooh, this is a, could be a big jump for me going from what I'm currently doing now into some sort of new technology. What type of have you run into any big issues with your customers so far, or the adoptions usually smooth? You want to talk about that a little bit, maybe? Yeah, sure. So you know, in terms of like, um, you, you know, at, at first glance, when you say the word kernel, and we we say the word like that twenty times a day, right? Yeah. You know, a, a lot of people get a little bit concerned because then they're thinking, oh, is this like Linux versus BSD, or is this, you, you know, those types of concerns start to come into mind, and maybe it's just the language that we use that maybe we should be saying things differently because, in our view, it's kind of like saying um, uh, using something like Heroku you know, which is on the platform as a service offerings, or as uh, uh, Mike, I think mentioned earlier, something like Lambda, you know, and so both of those models and, and the serverless, the entire serverless side of things, you know, they, they kind of have these hands off approaches towards deployment as well. Um, and they also have similar restrictions as well. You know, I, I don't know what the case is today about Heroku, but I know when they launched, it was most definitely um, kind of a single process. And if you wanted to scale, you just scale up more instances. Um, so there's, there's definitely differences, but I don't, I don't see that as challenging uh, necessarily. Most of, the, most of the requests that we get are just code that hasn't been written and needs to be written. So, so what does the steps, coming from that deployment perspective, um, how much lift is there for a DevOps team to, I want to use the phrase, unikernelize uh, their app so they can deploy it that manner rather than into a container? Sure. Um, so yeah, I, I would say you're going, to, you're going to get about the same sort of um, you know, work effort that you would find if you're going from, like say, an Amazon environment to a Google environment or from like Linux to containers, or it's that sort of transition. Um, so there's, there's definitely like things like configuration that you'll want to approach differently. Uh, things like, uh, you know, deployment in general that are going to be different, but they're not, they're not um, difficult. Like I said, um, that's one of the things that we're trying to do with this tool called ops um, over at ops.city is, is make it like, brain dead easy to to use and consume these things so much so that we want normal kind of um it folk you know people who don't code at all to deploy their database to deploy their web server to deploy whatever they need to be um deploying because i think until we can reach those people um you, you know it's it's going to limit growth 
Now, we were talking a little bit, too, about um, there's a lot definitely of, of call it ancient technology, perhaps, in our Unix and Linux-based systems. Um, no one's made any jokes yet about Linux on the desktop just around the corner. Um, right. But, um, you know, wait you know, a minute, about... Paul's running Linux on the desktop every day. <laughs> <laughs> this is a brave man. Um, but we're talking about, I think, some good parts of the conversation definitely are about revisiting what does this architecture look like and can we do something right. different? Um, what I'd also, you know, ask and bring us around to, there was a paper from NCC Group that was talking about, the, you know, took an early look at unikernels and was also throwing some caution or some observations that we don't necessarily want to throw away all of the security capabilities that are actually good things that have been emerging, especially with things like LLVM, their sanitizers, ASLR, um, writer execute. So are these, how, how much of these are, uh, remain relevant to unikernels? How much of these are more actually based on the specific implementations of the unikernels? Yeah, good question. Um, glad you brought that up too. Uh, so, so basically the NCC group paper, uh, that they wrote was roughly like 100 pages or so. And it's pretty damning, uh, to be honest. <laughs> uh, but basically, you know, there were their, their main um, insight, if you will, was basically there was a lot of this kind of free stuff that we've had in Linux for 10, 15 years now. And none of it was really addressed um, properly uh, in the implementations that they were looking at. Um, so like things like ASLR was just not present, uh, you know, executing on the stack, you know, which is classic, like Wild West 90s hacking. <laughs> you know? uh, none of that was really present. But, um, you, you know, it was mostly oversight. And, and that's that's a term that they used multiple times in their their paper was was just oversight. And so it's not like you can't add most of this stuff. Uh, it was just missing in some of the stuff that they were looking at. Uh, one of the things that you'll find in a lot of unikernel implementations out there is a lot of them are focused on IoT and edge deployments. Um, we're focused on cloud, but th there's a lot of IoT and edge stuff out there. And so they're usually looking at like space constrained um, uh, places. And so they're using things like, uh, it, you know, all these different alt libc's that don't have the same sort of um, sane security defaults. So that's that's one thing when you look at like oh well can you execute on heap for instance uh, can you uh, is there a stack canary in there well one thing to realize is that that's something that GCC actually will give you and then the operating system kind of abides by it's it's not like it's the operating system's fault or GCC's fault it's it's those two things working together to kind of provide that mechanism and so when you use an alt libc that might not have that you just need to be cognizant of that and um aware of that so uh so yeah i mean that's that's not a limitation like if you look at our kernel nanos um nothing they brought up in their paper were actually affected by uh so it's it's different implementations um you know in terms of the and i'll just jump into you know maybe what the next question is but you know in terms of the whole ringo versus ring three transition and so forth um that's something that's kind of uh overloaded I guess if if you look at some of the articles that are online, because a lot of people are simply not really aware of how um, x86 64 ABI actually operates. Uh, when you hear things like flat memory model and things like that, you need to realize that some of the language is addressing different um, ABIs. So, like in 32-bit ABI, we had the notion of segmentation, memory segmentation. Okay, so that still exists in 64, but it's absolutely not used. It's not used by Linux or anything like that. Um, and so, you know, and, and for Nanos, like the kernel that we're working on, that's 64-bit only, for instance. So, so there's little nuances there. Um, if, you, uh, if you, again, look at Nanos, we have kept in the, the notion of uh, privilege levels switching. So that's not, that's not the exact same thing, right? You have a privilege level of zero and then a privilege privilege level of a uh, three. And so we do make that transition. And the reason why is because all these page pr protections don't really mean a thing. If you can execute a couple of, uh, you know, uh, Intel instructions to change said permissions. And so we have kept that. Um, and that's, that's definitely one of those things that, 
you'll find a lot of implementations don't really look at. No, it's good. And I think pointed into um, sort of a concrete example, you'd mentioned uh, libxslt, um, so XML external entities. So, and, and you know, libxml or XML parsers have had some notoriously um, bad vulnerabilities in the past, whether it's an RCE or something like the billion laughs, like a DOS. Um, right. uh, what, 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 kind, what does that look like within a unikernel? So for example, um, with XXE, I'm already going to guess, based on what we've chatted about already, that it's not going to be able to pull down like a, the equivalent of an Etsy password, for example. Right. Um, but so, what, so yeah. this is where, um, in my opinion, um, some of the security stuff really starts coming into play, is that unikernels don't have the notion of users. If you look at the user syscalls and the group syscalls and things of that nature, they're simply stubs in most implementations. Um, why? Because there's no interactive type of usage that's present on these systems. There's no way to like SSH in or Telnet in. Um, you can't sue or sudo because the, there is no interactivity. The, the entire definition of a shell necess necessitates the idea that you're going to be spawning other programs. Like you're going to pipe the output from one program into another program, things of that nature. And so that entire idea doesn't even make sense in a unikernel land. Well, what's really interesting is okay so you found your you found your vulnerable piece of code and now you've coded up this exploit you know if you look at any of the shell code out there what's the first thing they want to do is pop a shell and it, it's not even that it's like well if you cat etsy password what, who cares what are you going to do with it you can't really log into it um and and so now you have to start getting really creative on you know what exactly are you going to do because most most people that are actually breaking into systems to do something, they don't care about your code. Um, and, and this is something that a lot of um, people don't really get, but uh, mo most people don't care about your code. They wanna do things like dump the database, they wanna install a crypto miner, they want to you know, uh, install you know, a bot that connects to IRC and becomes part of their botnet. Uh, there's, there's all these other things that they wanna do and that almost always entails running other programs. And so if you can't actually run another program because it's a single process system, now you're going to have to get really creative with your shell code. And you're going to have to figure out how to, you know, rock gadget your way to freedom. And that's just, that becomes insanely difficult, in my opinion. Yeah, you're, you're dealing with a pretty special um, actor if they're actually going specifically after right. your source code. Um, I think it's actually our CEO said to me the other day, uh, if you want to slow down your competitors, give them a copy of your source code. <laughs> In your case, that's true. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> <sighs> I know it's in in, I know it's under the cover since 1999 <laughs> on that one. <laughs> hey, I only look at the new good stuff, which is per absolutely perfect. Yeah, keep that but, under wraps because some of the old bad stuff is my code. So um, yeah, yeah. Let, let, and let's the policy on. compliance stuff is mine. <laughs> God help us. Yes. Oh, uh, but I think but, Ian but, makes a great point. Yeah, about, just real quick I mean, it's about, a great point, right? I mean, yeah. the first thing you try to do is you spawn a shell, download a file, create a command and control channel, and then figure out how to move laterally. If you can't, if you can't spawn the shell, you can't right. load a program, you can't create an external channel. That's ninety-five percent of all attacks, right there. It's, it's yeah. gone. I mean, you just reduce the footprint. Yeah, you, you look at uh, last year. It was like super popular to do all the. Uh, the uh, crypto jacking stuff. And so like, you know, with Drew Paul get in and all these other things, uh, it, you know, we literally had uh, these exploits coming out where the very first thing that they, they would do is look for other crypto miners on the system before they tried to install their own, you know, and stick it into a cron job and all this other stuff. And then it's just like, none of that, none of that works. You know? <laughs> so it's, it, it really takes like a dedicated, you know, nation state threat actor or some, something of that equivalent to, 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 to do anything. So. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. there's, there's and so still that aspect so, yeah, yeah. of the app with data though, right? And the secrets there. So we're not doing lateral movement, but the application layer vulnerability that could, you know, that SQL injection that's extract that's exfiltrating data out of the database, unikernel's kind of extraneous or, you know, um, orthogonal to that. It's one of my favorite words. Yeah. So attacks um, like that are still, but, you know, you can still execute something like right. that. Um, and, you know, obviously we don't solve for cross-site scripting or SQL injection right. or, you know, any of the other, 
more classic type of um, attacks. It's 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 really kind of like those the RCEs through the use of right. like, hey, I have the shell, and and that's you know it really comes back to this whole idea of you know what the unikernel actually is is that um, it's it's a single process system. It's simply it, and it, here's here's something that a lot of people you know again they they know but they don't think about maybe is Linux came out in ninety one. Uh, that's a full 10 years before VMware kind of started selling virtualization. And it was 15 years before we had a, a small little bookstore in uh, Seattle called Amazon unleash EC2. And so we didn't really have a great environment to do this sort of stuff back in the 90s, even though that's where a lot of leading um, comm sci people like Andrew Tannenbaum wanted to go. But uh, but now we do have that environment. And so now it's kind of begging the question of like, why why shouldn't we just you know, go that way. No, great point. I think that. Uh, some... Go ahead. Oh, I, I was just going to ask if if someone wanted to play with this Ian, and sort of get a, a taste for what you can do, would be the quickest way for them to get into it playing with ops, or do you have another yeah. method for them? Yeah, so ops is probably the best way. Um, ops dot city, um, because dot com was obviously too expensive. Um, <laughs> but uh, so uh, yeah, ops dot city is a little Go application. And what it does is it wraps itself around QMU uh, if you're running it locally, but it also allows you to, to uh, deploy to things like Google. And so, um, and, and that's kind of the intention is to deploy to a production virtualized environment. I'm not, I'm not really a fan of, uh, you know, running these things locally. It, just like I, I would never run containers locally on my laptop. So um, you can, but it's, it, to me, it kind of defeats the purpose. It's, I view it more of a, kind of a production uh, deployment thing. And then the follow on to that, uh, when folks are running this in prod, like you said, you got support in there for Amazon, for Google. Are you finding more people doing this private cloud, public cloud? Uh, what sort of the, the mix up? Yeah, not to, not to give away our company secrets, but every dollar that we have has come from private cloud. <laughs> so it, it's, uh, if, you, if you start looking at like big companies, um, any large big company is predominantly running their own uh, servers. You know, it's just it doesn't make financial sense for them to uh, to do that uh, in in the cloud. And so a lot of them are struggling with having to to run this massive amount of software, you know, on their own systems. I mean, if you talk to any bank, for instance, you know, you talk to Amex, they're like, oh yeah, we got like ten thousand developers. You talk to BOA, we have like fifteen twenty thousand developers. You know, and it. It, like everybody has the same story. It's like, where do you deploy this? <laughs> so it's, uh, they all have to deploy it on their own hardware and their own software. And so that becomes really insanely hard if you're not a traditional tech company to, to kind of manage your own cloud like environment. Great. Cool. Well, I think we have to, um, you mentioned me memory segmentation on 32 versus 64 bit. We have our own time segmentation between our interview <laughs> segments and the news. Um, so I think we're going to have to say thank you very much, Ian. This was a great intro to Unikernels sure. and a great discussion about different security um, to think about. All right, guys. Thank thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, John. We'll take a quick break, and then we're going to return with News of the Week.